Hey, Rob, it's Monday. Man, I hate Mondays. <sighs> Me too, but not this Monday because we're back. We're back. This is, this is session five of the 2022 edition of AP Daily Live, and we are thrilled to be back with you again for week two. Woohoo! Um, back to do some review and some practice and some multiple choice and some free response and just general prep for the soon to be arriving AP computer science A exam. So welcome back, everybody. We're happy that you're with us. So let's, um, Tim, how about we start out with some shout outs before we dig in here? Let's do it. Okay, so let's start with DODEA Virtual High School. Now, this is students that are at U.S. military installations around the world, literally country after country after country. Uh, so welcome to all of you that are, that are stationed um, overseas and uh, with us from DODEA. Fantastic. Also, shout out to Calvert High School in Prince Frederick, Maryland. Okay, how about um, Padua Franciscan High School in Parma, Ohio? Awesome. And welcome to Tuscaloosa County High School in Alabama. All right, and I'd like to welcome Prospect High School in Saratoga, California. Also, big shout out to Plano East Senior High School in Texas. Okay, and I've got another international one. This is the American School in Tehran, Saudi Arabia. Awesome, and then also the Jose Marti STEM Academy in Union City, New Jersey. Welcome, glad to have well, you. Welcome, everybody. We are so happy to have you with us. So, um, I suppose we probably ought to jump right in. We've got a lot to cover today. So let's let's dig in and let's talk about what we're going to learn today. All right. So to start, um, today's bit of the day will be a look at the Java Quick Reference. Now, this is the sheet that you're going to have access to on the AP exam with some little things that might be kind of helpful. Um, we're going to go back and we're going to look at the creation of class methods. And there might be a couple other things thrown in with that one, too, as far as methods and control structures. We're going to look at multiple choice question review. We'll practice a couple multiple choice questions. And then we're going to look at the digits 2017 free response question. Now, last week, we did all of the 2021 questions um, from the 2021 exam. This week, we're going to kind of shift things around a little bit. We're going to look at, at questions from, from different years. So, all right. So that's, what, that's what's on our agenda for today. Tim, I'm going to pass it over to you. All right. So let's start with our bit of the day. So our bit of the day, as Rob mentioned, is going to be the Java Quick Reference Sheet. Now, this is a, a sheet that you get as part of your AP exam that you'll have for both the multiple choice and the free response questions. And this is really small. You can't see this on your screen too well, I'm sure. Um, but it's a very, very important sheet. So I'm going to go ahead and, and blow up individual parts of it. We'll start with the top here. And the top is uh, talking about the string class. And so this whole reference sheet are, are things from the Java library that, that may be uh, included in the exam. And this is a great tool that you should always have right next to you uh, the entire time you're taking the AP exam. It's provided as part of your exam materials. You don't have to bring your own. But but you'll, as soon as you start taking the exam, find this and make sure you have it with you to answer all the different questions. So the first part, as I mentioned, is uh, the string class. And we've, we've talked about string class. We'll look at some string uh, questions as well. And notice how um, it goes through the constructors and the methods. So there is the string constructor, creates a new string object. We know we can also use uh, equals with double quotes. There's some methods that come in very handy, such as length, substring. And if you get confused with how to substring work, Work and where it starts from and, and is it one parameter or two parameters? Well, here are the two different versions of substring. Uh, the first one going from uh, starting at index from and ending at the uh, two minus one index. So it's up to but not including that second uh, index number. If you use substring with one parameter, that means a part of the string starting it from all the way to the end. So all the way through length. There's index of, which we saw in an earlier video. It talked about uh, finding the first occurrence of a string. It returns negative one if not found. There's the dot equals method to compare two strings and also a compare to, which returns a positive or negative or zero based on comparison of strings. And that's the string class on the reference sheet. The next part of the reference sheet is the integer and double classes. Um, and these are for 
uh, for integer objects and double objects, we know that Java allows auto boxing uh, now, so we don't need to worry about them as much as we used to. But uh, just know that we can create integer objects. There is a integer dot min value and integer dot max value to indicate the smallest and largest uh, values represented by an int or an integer object, um, and then also the int value method as well as the double value method that gives you the values contained within those integer or double objects. And then we have our math class. And the math class is real important. We saw that all over. We've seen that numerous times in our videos. We have the uh, abs method, which is the absolute value uh, for integers or doubles. We have pow, which gives us the uh the the first parameter raised to the power of our second parameter we have the squirt method the square root which returns the positive square root of a particular double parameter that you send it and then also random which we know returns the value between zero and then less than one uh, next on the reference sheet is the array list class. So we know arrays use brackets, but array list being a being a class has methods associated with it. So we have the size, which tells us the number of elements in the list. We know we can add either at the end of a list or at a particular index. We know we have the get, set, and remove methods again, which give us a value at an index, which can replace a value at an index, or remove a value at a particular index. And as Rob showed in a prior uh, uh, free response question, how we have to, those, when we do a remove, the values get shifted in our array list. And finally, we're going to end up with the object class, the, the super class of all super classes. And we know there's two methods that we commonly override in the object class, the equals method and the two string method as well. And so that's our reference sheet. And those come in very handy during the exam. So make sure you have that. Make sure you refer to that both while you're taking the multiple choice and while you're doing the free response portion of the exam. So that's our bit of the day. And uh, Rob, what do you say we uh, do some review? OK, let's do it. OK, I've got the screen. There we go. Um, all right, so here's what I want to do for our review today. We're going to talk about how we create class methods, but I want to throw in some other stuff too. Um, I want to make sure that we're getting the most bang for our buck out of this. So I've got a couple things combined that we're going to look at as we create our new method. So for this example, we're going to say we want to create a class method called find sum that takes an integer value num as a parameter and then finds and returns the sum of the individual digits of num. Now, it's fairly common either in multiple choice or in free response or maybe even both to have a question that asks you to isolate individual digits of an integer. So that's why I kind of wanted to work that into our review as we're also looking at how we create a class method. OK, so to start, um, an example would be as we call find sum with the number 90823, 90,823. The idea that the idea would be that this method would take the individual digits of 90,823, add them together and find the sum 22. Um, another example, if I do 555,555, I should end up with a returned value of 30. OK, because all we're doing is we're isolating each individual digit and then adding them to find the sum. OK, um, so some things to think about. Um, the first thing, we have to maintain a sum. So at some point, we're going to have to create a variable and then add to it as we as we cycle through all of the digits of our value. Um, and the second thing is, obviously, we have to isolate the individual digits. So the question is, how do we do that? All right. So this is where we do a little math review. Um, when you think back to how we learned to do long division, and I'm not going to show the whole thing broken all the way down. But basically, um, remember that if we take a number and divide it, we end up with a quotient and a remainder. OK, so if I take 90,823 and I divide by 10, for example, the quotient is going to be 9,082. And, you know, your math teachers can thank me for this later. Um, your remainder is going to be three. So 10 goes into 90,823, 9,000, uh, 9,082 times with three left over. OK, well, in Java world, what that would mean would be if I define a variable called quotient, and remember that in Java, an integer divided by an integer gives us an integer, the first two lines of code that I have here identify the quotient. It doesn't give us a decimal value. It doesn't give us anything related to the remainder. If I take 90,823 divided by 10 as an integer divided by integer, 
it's going to display 9,082. OK, um, if I say I want to create an int remainder and I do 90,823 modulus 10. OK, remember what modulus does. Modulus finds the remainder of a division problem. And then I display the, the returned value. It's going to display three. So that's how I can use division and modulus when I'm dealing with integers to isolate individual digits and cycle through and find all of the digits um, in an integer value. OK, so remember, our rules are going to be we're going to use modulus to find the remainder of a division operation, and we're going to use division to find the quotient of a division operation. OK, so now let's put that in the context of working on this specific method that we want to create, our find some method. OK, so first thing, we have to think about the method signature. We want it to be public so that it's available to other objects. We want to have an int return type because we know it's going to return the integer sum of all of our digits. It has the name find sum, and it has a single integer parameter that's the value, the, the integer value that's being passed in. All right. Um, the first thing that we have to kind of think about is we have to maintain a sum, which means I have two different things to take care of. We need to declare and initialize a variable to represent our sum and set it equal to zero. And then we also have to keep in mind, um, you know, one of the things that I've, I've, I've kind of noticed in my own classroom, students get so focused on the algorithm that they forget about the fact that we actually need to return the answer at the end. So because we know we're going to create a sum and we have to return a sum, we can go ahead and write those at the top and bottom of our method before we even get started with the algorithm part. OK, um, the second thing we have to do is we have to make sure we're isolating individual digits. So that's where our modulus and division are going to come into play. OK, the first thing we have to do is we have to isolate a digit um, from num. And we're going to use modulus to do that. And remember, anytime we do modulus 10, um, again, if you think about what we might maybe learned in, in math class in elementary school, we have the ones place and the tens place, the hundreds place, the thousands, ten thousands, and so on. Um, doing modulus 10 is always going to identify the digit in the ones place. So we're going to take that individual digit, whatever value is in the ones place, and add it to our sum. We also need to make sure that once we've processed that digit that we remove it from num. So that's where we can say, OK, well, let's take num and set it equal to itself divided by 10. So even though we're using kind of this abbreviated divided by equals, um, we can really say this is kind of the same thing as num equals num divided by 10, which we know from the example we just looked at eliminates the far right digit. And then we need this process to repeat as long as num is greater than 0. OK, so um, if I start with 90,823, we'll isolate the three, and then the two, and then the eight, and then the zero, and then the nine. And by the time we get through with the nine, as soon as I do nine divided by uh, nine divided by ten, um, that's going to give us a value of zero, and we know that's when we can jump out of our while loop and we return our sum. Okay, so there's our review. Um, we end up with a method called find sum that will isolate each individual digit of an integer value and add them together so that we get a sum of the individual digits. Okay. There we go. Hope everybody enjoyed that. And again, your math teachers can thank me later. That's a great skill. You know what? I, it always happens, Rob, on the AP exam, right? Those isolation of digits and just knowing how to divide by 10, mod by 10. Fantastic. So... Awesome. Hey, uh, let's practice. So we're going to do some multiple choice here. And I specifically did some multiple choice questions here that are dealing deal with calling methods from the quick reference sheet that we just looked at earlier during the bit of the day. So um, our first one here says, consider the following code segment. And looks like I've got a string. And it says I have a string called original, and then I have a string called update, which looks like it's doing some concatenation and it prints things out. So knowing what the methods of the string class are and what I could use and what they do, can we determine what is printed as a result of executing the code segment? So multiple choice, go ahead and hit pause here and take a second to trace through this code and we'll come back and trace through it together. All the tracing done. All right, here we go. So what are we going to do here? Well, um, with this uh, particular question, because there's a string involved, I want to immediately pull up my Java quick reference and look at some of the methods 
that are being used in this question, such as substring and index of, and, and notice how substring works and how index of works. So if you have a copy of that, always good to do um, when even when you're practicing these questions as well, because you will have that quick reference on the uh, AP exam day. So um, knowing that, what are we going to do? Well, I've got my string tomorrow, so I'm going to go ahead and write that down. And because I'm using substring and, and different index values, I went ahead and put the index numbers underneath the word tomorrow as well, zero through seven. I always start with zero. So the first thing I'm going to do when I'm when I'm creating my new string update, and it looks like I'm doing different parts concatenated together, I'm going to do original dot substring two. Now, what does that do? If I just put one parameter in there, does it give me just the M? Nope. It actually gives me from two to the end. It gives me from two all the way to the rest of the word. So it gives me the word morrow. So when doing multiple choice questions, always a good idea to make sure you know what the answers are. Keep an eye on the answers. So we know because update's going to start with morrow, it's not going to be A and it's not going to be B because those were um, some, uh, some distractor answers that for people that thought that substring two might have just given you the M. All right, what comes next? Original dot substring zero comma three. So what does that give us? Does that give us from zero to three? Remember it gives us from zero, but up to and not including three. So it actually only gives us the T-O-M. So when I put that on there, so it's not going to be choice E because that's Maro Tomo, right? So it's just going to be Maro Tom. And then finally, it's going to ask for the original dot index of row. And remember what index of it, it goes through and finds where row exists in this string tomorrow. And if we look at the index numbers at the bottom, which is why it's a good idea to go ahead and number them, I see that row begins at index number five. So as a result, I know it's going to give me a five back, which means D is not the answer. And my answer has to be C, which is Morrow Tom five. And that's going to be substring two to the end, substring zero three, and then index of row. How'd you do? Did you get C? Great. Let's try one more uh, using, again, some of the methods found on the Java quick reference sheet. So uh, let's look at this one. This says, uh, using math.random, it says, which of the following Java statements assigns a random integer between 10 and 30 inclusive, so meaning including 10 and including 30 and all the numbers in between, all the integers in between, which of these statements assigns any one of those random values to value? So we've got different variations of using math.random. Looks like we're casting them all as in, so we're calling math.random, and this is a static method. Um, so we're saying class.method, right? Um, so let's go ahead and pause here and see if you can determine which of these code statements gives us a value between 10 and 30 inclusive to value. Go ahead and hit pause and see if you can figure out which one of these is correct. All right, here we go. So I want to go through each one of these and see which each one of these gives us. And so we can help that help us differentiate between, you know, the different types of calls to math.random and, and multiplying and adding and what those numbers do. So let's go th uh, through and start with, I, I, I'm writing down value. I'm going to write down the different values that I have um, as I'm going through here. So we start, again, order of operations. We're going to start inside of our parentheses. I'm going to look at math.random. Right. And what does math.random give us? Well, it gives us a number between zero up to but not including one, right? So up from zero to 0.99999, some number in between there. It's a double, right? And then what am I going to do? Well, this one says I'm going to multiply it by 10. Okay, that means it's going to give me a number between zero and 9.999, right? And then what? Well, then we're going to cast it as an int. So that gets rid of the decimal. So now it's just going to be an integer from zero to nine. Right, so zero through nine, still inclusive of those two. And then, so times 10 increases the range of values, right? And then what does the plus 30 do? Well, I'm gonna add 30 to whatever random number I get. That means I'm gonna, instead of a number between zero and nine, I now have a number between 30 and 39. So that doesn't work. So value is gonna be a number between 30 and 39, but I wanted to trace through that so you can see exactly what we get. And I hope that helps determine what the correct answer could be here. So it's not A. All right, well, let's try B. So what do we do for B? Math.random, 0 to 0.9999 times 10, 9.999. Make it an integer. So 0 to 9. 
Okay, but now what if I add 20 to it? What does that do? Well, that's closer. It gives me 20 to 29, so I'm in the ballpark. Uh, but notice that range is still just 10, right? From 20 to 29, it, that's 10 integers. And I want a lot more than that. I went from 10 to 30. So let's try, uh, it's not gonna be B, let's try C, see what C does for us. So C says, math.random, Zero to, nine point, zero to point nine 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 times 20 this time, right? So now I'm going to get a number between 0 and 19.9999. Make it an int, cast it as an integer, gives me 0 to 19. That's a little bit bigger. Uh, plus 10, that gives me 10, but it only goes to 29. I'm one short, so where am I off? Think about where did I did I mess up here? Should I have Should I have added... 11 yeah but then i would have started it would have been 11 to 30 so i uh, i'm not quite sure well let's try another one so c is not it let's try d so d says math that random zero to 0.999 times 21 this time what's going to happen here now i'm going to get zero to 20.9999 right and now when i make it an int it's zero to 20 well let's add 20 to it oh it's gonna be 20 to 40. I'm really close. Rob, I'm getting tired here. I've gone through four of them already. You got one to go. You oh, can make it. I'm, I'm hoping, let me tell you, I really hope E's the answer. Because if not, we're, you know, we're going to be in trouble. It's the only one left. All right, let's see what we got here. Math.random, 0 to 0.999 times 21, 0 to 20.999. Okay. Cast it as an int. I got 0 to 20. So there's my, my range of so values. Far, so oh, good. But now I'm going to add 10. 10 to 30. It works. Ease Perfect. my answer. Oh, I was sweating it out there for a minute. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we made it. So hopefully you answered E, right? So we have our values from, from 10 to 30 inclusive. And so notice the times 21 was key because that gave me the numbers. Because really from 10 to 30, that's 21 values, right? So, um, and then cast it as an int, got rid of my decimals, and then adding 10, that's my offset. Instead of going from zero to 20, I wanted from 10 to 30. And so that offset really helped as well too. Hope you did well. All right, so gonna turn it back over to Rom, Rob, Ron, who's Ron? Rob, I, Hi, Tim, I'm, I'm Rob, nice to meet you. Nice, nice to meet you, Rob, I'm Tom, Tom Morrow. Tom, Tim, we, yes. we can do that. Tomorrow we could be Tom and Ron. Tom and Ron, nice. I don't like it. Oh man, it's it's, it's you know what? It's uh, it's Monday. That's why, because it's I hate Mondays. That's got to be what it is. Here, I'm going to give control back over to you, so you can do our free response question example, Rob. Thanks, T Tim. Tim, right? Tim. Okay. L last I checked. Hold on. Yes. All right. Let's take a look at example. Now, last week, like I said, we covered all of the 2021 free response questions. This year, we're going to go a little bit earlier. And uh, so we're going to look at 2017. This is free response question number one, the digits question. And I like this question, and I like doing it with my students in class, because there are several things kind of blended in here together. Not only is it a good review of some methods and control structures type things, but it also includes array lists, which means we've got some other things we need to kind of think about as we go too. Okay, so um, this question involves identifying, and you're gonna kind of notice some of the things we're gonna talk about in this one from the review that I did with you a little bit ago. This question involves identifying and processing the digits of a non-negative integer. So this is one of those examples where um, an actual question in the exam had us separating at, at the numeric integer, the, the separate digits from an integer value, okay? Um, so we're given the declaration of this digits class, and it says we're going to write the constructor and one method for this class. So the first thing they tell us is we have this private array list integer, uh, array list of integer objects called digit list. And then we've got a constructor, and our constructor says we're going to construct a digits object uh, that represents num. Okay, so in our constructor, we're given an integer value, and it says this is going to be implemented in part A. Then we've also got this separate method down here called is strictly increasing. And this one's a Boolean method. It returns true if the digits in this digits object are in strictly increasing order and false otherwise. So we'll talk a little more in a second about what strictly increasing order means. Okay. All right, you ready to dive in? Let's take a look at part A. 
So part A says we're going to write the constructor for the digits class. Um, I wanted to specify that it says we're going to initialize and fill the digit list. Uh, so if you remember when we saw the class declaration, there's a, a declaration of our instance variable, but it's never really initialized. I mean, that's part of the, the job of the constructor. So we have to initialize and fill digit list with the digits from the non-negative integer num that's passed in as our parameter. Um, it also says the elements of digit list must be integer objects oops, uh, representing single digits, and they must appear in the same order as the digits in num. So not only do I have to take the individual digits from my value and put them separately into digit list, but I have to make sure I do it in the correct order. Okay, it says there, uh, we've got two examples. It says the following examples shows the declaration of a digits object and the contents of digit list as initialized by the constructor. So I'm gonna start with example two first um, because it's a little more straightforward. If, if I create a digits object called D2 and I pass in the, the integer value zero because it says that our integer num will be a non-negative integer. So zero is valid. Well, there aren't really any other digits besides zero to deal with. So really all we have to do is just take the integer value zero and add it to digit list and we're done. Okay, so that one's kind of an easy example. There we go, like that. Okay, um, if I look at example one, example one, there's a little more involved. And this is where we have to kind of think back to some of the things we reviewed a little earlier. Okay, so let's say num is 15,704. Well, again, I need to isolate the individual digits from num and I need to put them into an array list in the correct order. So if you remember from our review, if I say 15,704 modulus 10, that gives me the ones digit, it gives me a value of four. Once I have that value, then I can add it to my array list. But then I have to eliminate it so I don't count it twice. So this is where we can go through and we can use integer division and we can find the quotient. 15,704 divided by 10 equals 1,570. And by taking this value and passing it back and storing it as num, okay, well, now I can just kind of keep repeating the cycle until I hit zero. 1,570 modulus 10 gives us zero, the value in the ones place. Once I have that value, I can add it, but notice I'm adding it at the front of my array list, which that's one of the things that's on that quick reference sheet. Maybe some of the methods that we have for array lists that tell us how we add a, a, a value or an object into our array list at a specific index position. Okay, once I've taken zero and I've, I've added it to my array list, we need to remove the zero. So 1,570 divided by 10 is 157. We put 157 back in for num and we repeat. Okay, so 157 modulus 10 gives us seven. We put seven in the front of our array list. Uh, we take 157 divided by 10 to, to eliminate the seven and give us 15 and we repeat. So 15 modulus 10 equals five. We add the five to the front of our array list. We divide by 10 to get one and we repeat one last time. One modulus 10 is gonna give us one. And if I take one divided by 10, we get zero and that's our signal to stop. Okay, so now that we've worked through an example and we kind of see what this process is, Again, think about, think about the tip that Tim gave us in an earlier video where he said, think about the algorithm first. So I'm gonna leave that to you for this one. I want you to pause. I want you to take maybe a minute or two and very kind of quickly sketch out what the algorithm for this is gonna look like before you start to code, okay? And then when you're ready to come back and go through the solution, press play. So go ahead and pause and I'll see you in about 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, that felt like about 10 or 15 minutes to me. Tim, what do you think? Uh, it was the longest 15 minutes of my life, Rob. I couldn't oh, wait to sorry get back. About that. Oh, I'm, I'm glad we're back. Okay, so um, let's take a look and see how we did. So we've got our header, public digits. And again, this is our constructor. So we're passing in num. The first thing we have to do is we have to actually initialize digit lists. We have to actually create a new array list of integers um, and assign it to digit list so that we have an array list that we can actually add to. Okay, um, we said that if num equals zero, this was our first example, okay, the example we did. If num equals zero, this is kind of an easy one. All I have to do is just add zero to my digit list and then we're done with that number. But if our number is not equal to zero, this is where we have to start thinking about how we're gonna process individual digits. So remember we said inside a loop, as long as num is greater than zero, 
we're going to go through. And we've got a lot kind of packed into this one line. So I'm going to kind of break this down a little bit. Um, working from the inside out, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take our number modulus 10. That's going to give us the rightmost digit. And then we're going to use the add method for our array list to say, OK, we want to take that value and we want to add it at position zero. Because again, we want to make sure we're adding our values to the, to the front of our array list so that they stay in order. OK, once we've taken that number, we've identified the rightmost digit then we need to eliminate it. And the best way to eliminate it is to find the quotient of num divided by 10. So all I have to do is say num divided by equals 10. Again, that's kind of the equivalent of saying num equals num divided by 10. And then we repeat. And as long as num is greater than 10, we're going to identify the rightmost digit. We're going to add it to our array list. We're going to eliminate the rightmost digit. Go again. And we're just going to keep that process going. So there is our solution to part A of digits from 2017. How'd you do? Hopefully everybody caught that. Um, hopefully everybody remember to throw in the check to see what happens when num equals zero when it's handed to us. Um, okay, so let's take a look at part B. Part B is where we write the method is strictly increasing. And it says the method returns true if the elements of digit list appear in strictly increasing order, Otherwise, we return false. And it says a list is considered in strictly increasing uh, or is considered strictly increasing if each element after the first is greater than but not equal to the preceding element. OK, so we've got a table that, that shows some results. So let's say we call is strictly increasing on seven. OK, so we've got this digits object. We're calling the constructor to create a digits object with the value seven. So when I call is strictly increasing, well, there's really only one digit there. So you can't really have one digit that isn't increasing. So by default, if it's a single digit, it's true. It has a, a true return value. OK, if I pass in 1,356 to my constructor and then I call is strictly increasing. OK, well, think about how this works. And this goes back to an earlier video where Tim walked us through um, different algorithms that involve array traversals. Well, in this case, we're traversing an array list. But I'm going to look at consecutive pairs of elements of my array list to see if one is bigger than but not equal to the other. So in this case, three is greater than one, and five is greater than three, and six is greater than five. And we get to the end, and we haven't found anything where the value that follows is less than or equal to. So this is also going to return true. If I pass in 1,336, OK, well, I'm going to do that same traversal comparing consecutive pairs. One and three are OK, but as soon as I hit three and three, you know, three is now equal to three. So I can't say that that's strictly increasing because they're equal to each other. So that returns false. OK, um, and same thing with 1,536. You know, the one and five are OK. As soon as I hit five and three, well, now the value that precedes the three is less than. So it's definitely not strictly increasing. That's going to return false. And with 65,310, the first pair I look at uh, shows that we're not strictly increasing anymore. So I think Tim mentioned at one point that we don't even have to keep going. We know as soon as we find one that kind of breaks the rule, we can return false and we're done at that point. OK, so there are some examples. Um, again, I want you to take about 10 minutes or so and see if you can come up with a solution for our is strictly increasing method. Go ahead and hit pause. And when you've had a chance to think about it and play with it a little bit, um, go ahead and press play to come back. And we're back. Welcome back, everybody. Um, another 10 minutes that we that we kind of took here to kind of play with this a little bit. Everybody do OK. Uh, I hope so. All right. So let's look at our is strictly increasing method. So notice it's a Boolean method. We're going to have a Boolean return type. So there's got to be a return in here somewhere. We don't really have any parameters we're dealing with because we're going to look at digit list, our array list. Um, that, that's one of our instance variables. Um, we had something kind of similar to this before in an earlier video where, where Tim was using a for loop. And we talked about the fact that we had to stop one before we got to the end. In fact, I think that's popped up in a couple of examples that we've looked at. So in this case, we have a for loop. We're going to traverse an array list. Um, and we're going to start at position 0, but we're making sure that we stop one before the end. OK, and I'm going to explain why in just a second. So as we traverse our array list, starting in position 0, we said that we have to compare the element at position i 
to whatever the element is that follows it. So we're going to compare 0 to 1, and then 1 to 2, and 2 to 3. So our condition is going to be if the value at position i is greater than or equal to the value at position i plus 1. In other words, it is not strictly increasing because the value at, say, position zero is greater than or equal to the value that follows it. Well, right there, we said that's when we would immediately say, hey, we found a, a condition where this can't possibly work. So what do we do when we hit that point? Well, we just say, OK, we're going to return false and we're done. You know, go directly to jail. Do not pass go. Do not collect your two hundred dollars. That's it. The method finishes at that point. Um, and the reason that we have to make sure we stop one short is because of this i plus one. If we go all the way up to size, then we're going to go to the next element after that. And that's where we're going to run into our in, uh, index out of bounds exception. So we want to make sure we avoid those. So we always want to be, be careful, especially if we're comparing cons uh, consecutive pairs, that we stop one short so we don't go out of bounds. Now, if we go through this entire loop and we never find a condition that causes us to return false, then that tells us that everything is okay. Everything is in strictly increasing order. So as soon as we jump out of the for loop, the final thing we would do before the method comes to an end is simply return true because we have found a number that is strictly increasing. Okay, and there's our solution. So hopefully everybody did okay with that one. I hope there are no questions. Everybody's doing all right. Um, okay, so Tim, I'm gonna pass it back to you for our takeaway. All right, great job, Rob. Um, let's look at what should we take away. And again, we've got that 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 file full of falling papers. Our, our top secret. Uh, so many things. Uh, so many so things many to take things. away uh, here. So uh, so today we we talked about the bit of the day was the Java Quick Reference, and definitely take that with you. Make sure you have that. Uh, find that on the AP exam when you're taking it. We um, Rob talked about the creation of class methods and uh, some some great stuff with with mod and div division as well. We had a multiple choice review, and then Rob just reviewed the 2017 digits free response question. And a little bit about tomorrow's video. Uh, tomorrow's bit of the day is going to be the College Board endorsed providers. We're going to talk about some of the outside companies that have been officially endorsed by College Board. Again, just giving you more resources to help prepare for the uh, Computer Science A exam. We're going to get into inheritance relationships, which will be a lot of fun. Uh, of course, the multiple choice question review as you trace through a few uh, multiple choice questions. And then we're going to look at the string checker question from the 2018 free response question, which has been modified so that it works better with our um, the type of free response questions that we have today. So that is it for us here uh, this new week. So thank you so much for joining us here at AP Daily Live 2022. Um, again, uh, I hope you're getting a lot out of these videos and feel like that you're in a much better position to take the AP exam. Rob? Happy to see everybody again this week and uh, can't wait to see you again tomorrow. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, hope everybody has a great day. Awesome. Thanks so much. Take care, folks. Bye, everybody.